The day I left home for the first time to go to university was a bright day, brimming with hope and optimism. I'd done well at school, expectations for me were high, and I gleefully entered the student life of lectures, parties and traffic cone theft. And as the first semester ended and the second begun, there was no way that anyone could have predicted what was just about to happen. I was leaving a seminar when it started. Humming to myself, fumbling with my bag, just as I'd done a hundred times before. When suddenly I heard a voice calmly observe, she is leaving the room. I looked around and there was no one there, but the clarity and decisiveness of the comment was unmistakable. Shaken, I left my books on the stairs and hurried home, and there it was again. She is opening the door. This was the beginning. The voice had arrived. And the voice persisted, days and then weeks of it, on and on, narrating everything I did in the third person. A hospital admission followed, the first of many. A diagnosis of schizophrenia came next. And then, worst of all, a toxic, tormenting sense of hopelessness, humiliation and despair about myself and my prospects. But having been encouraged to see the voice, not as an experience, but as a symptom, my fear and resistance towards it intensified. Now, essentially, this represented taking an aggressive stance towards my own mind, a kind of psychic civil war. And in turn, this caused the number of voices to increase and grow progressively hostile and menacing. Helplessly and hopelessly, I began to retreat into this nightmarish inner world in which the voices were destined to become both my persecutors and my only perceived companions. Two years later, and the deterioration was dramatic. By now, I had the whole frenzied repertoire. Terrifying voices, grotesque visions, bizarre, intractable delusions. My mental health status had been a catalyst for discrimination, verbal abuse and physical and sexual assault. And crucially, they helped me to understand something which I'd always suspected, that my voices were a meaningful response to traumatic life events, particularly childhood events, and as such were not my enemies, but a source of insight into solvable emotional problems. Now, at first, this was very difficult to believe, not least because the voices appeared so hostile and menacing. So in this respect, a vital first step was learning to separate out a metaphorical meaning from what I'd previously interpreted to be a literal truth. I would set boundaries for the voices and try to interact with them in a way that was assertive yet respectful, establishing a slow process of communication and collaboration in which we could learn to work together and support one another. Throughout all of this, what I would ultimately realize was that each voice was closely related to aspects of myself, and that each of them carried overwhelming emotions that I'd never had an opportunity to process or resolve. Memories of sexual trauma and abuse, of anger, shame, guilt, low self-worth. The voices took the place of this pain and gave words to it. And possibly one of the greatest revelations was when I realized that the most hostile and aggressive voices actually represented the parts of me that had been hurt the most profoundly. And as such, it was these voices that needed to be shown the greatest compassion and care. It was armed with this knowledge that ultimately I would gather together my shattered self, each fragment represented by a different voice, gradually withdraw from all my medication and return to psychiatry. I'm now very proud to be a part of InterVoice, the organizational body of the International Hearing Voices Movement, an initiative inspired by the work of Professor Marius Rohm and Dr. Sonja Escher, which locates voice hearing as a survival strategy, a sane reaction to insane circumstances. In the last 20 years, the Hearing Voices Movement has established Hearing Voices Networks in 26 countries across five continents, working together to promote dignity, solidarity and empowerment for individuals in mental distress to create a new language and practice of hope. <laughs>